All right, we're in the book of Job. This is uh, lesson number two in this, uh, in this series. Uh, the book of Job, faithful living in times of crisis. So we, we don't, it's not a stretch to try to apply what we've been talking about in Job to our own lives and the situation that uh, many of us uh, are facing personally and also you know, as a group, as a nation, as a country. You know, if, there, if, if this isn't a time of crisis, <laughs> I don't know what is. Uh, this lesson tonight, we're going to talk about the characters uh, in the uh, book of Job, as well as various ways of outlining um, this uh, book for proper study. So we're using the book of Job to guide us in an effort to live uh, faithful lives while experiencing personal or national crisis. It's easy to be faithful you know, when you're on a smooth ride. Uh, it gets a little difficult when the ride gets, uh, gets bumpy. For some people, believe it or not, the greatest danger uh, to their faith is when the ride is smooth. There, it's a smooth ride, there's no challenge. We're just coasting along and that's when we get lazy, we get sloppy, we get careless with our faith, we let things go, we cut corners. you know. But this is not uh, that time. We definitely are in a time of uh, crisis. Now, Job himself did not live during a time of war or famine. The type of uh, social and national crisis that imposes you know, hardship on the individual regardless of their personal circumstances. Job's crisis was personal it was imposed on him through supernatural means, but it was experienced fully in a physical and emotional way. We'll find out uh, as we study, he loses his wealth, his family, his health, his status in society, he loses everything. And he experiences that. Everything else around him you know, just kept going on as, as normal. There was no war going on, but his life was the crisis. And so uh, we said that uh, the core of Job's book describes his reaction to unjust suffering. His reaction to unjust uh, suffering. If you had to kind of you know, boil it all down to about one sentence, I think that uh, describes uh, pretty much uh, what is happening in this book. Basically, he was a good man who was subjected to what he believed to be undeserved suffering. He was a good man and he didn't understand why he was suffering. And Job's dilemma lay in the fact that he believed the theology of the day, of that particular day, that taught that suffering was the direct result of personal sin. In other words, God punished sinners in real time. You do something bad, something bad is going to happen to you. You do something good, then something good is going to happen to you. And that's the way things operated. Not really, but that's how people thought things uh, uh, operated. God punished uh, sinners. And you know what? We, we, we still have that feeling today. And we think about Job, oh yeah, well that was back then. But that, haven't we ever experienced the same feeling? Haven't, hasn't, uh, have, have you not ever experienced a, a bad thing that happens? I don't know, you know somebody uh, smashes your car or, or someone that you love comes down with a serious illness or you yourself have a terrible accident and you're lying there in the hospital with your leg in traction and you know, your head, maybe you've got a concussion and that thought kind of sneaks across your mind. What did I do? to deserve this. You know, even though you're a strong Christian, even though you believe that you're saved and that God is good and God is just and all this, that thought still comes at the back of your mind. How many people say, oh, it's my fault, it's something that I did. They blame themselves for something that they have absolutely no control over, but somehow they're ready to take the blame for it. Well, th this attitude was crystallized in a, in a doctrine, in a, in a teaching, uh, at the time when, uh, uh, at the time when uh, Job lived. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Hinduism, uh, Hinduism and Buddhism still has that idea. You know, you ever hear of karma? That's that idea. Karma, you know, whatever you do, 
you do good, good will come back to you. You do bad, then you know, God will punish you. So that idea, that thought, that theological concept still exists in religions of today. This teaching, which, and here's the problem, Job himself ascribed to this teaching. His problem was that the teaching or the belief that he had did not match his personal experience. You see, he knew that he was a good man. He knew it. And he could not understand why he was made to suffer. I mean, you know when you're doing okay. You know when you're acting properly according to your conscience. You know when you're doing, quote, good. You know when you're doing your best. Job knew this about himself. And he also knew that God was just. So he not only suffered, but he had no way to explain it, which added to the, the burden. You know, you, you forget to turn off the, uh, the stove and, and, and you leave and you know, the fire catches uh, in your kitchen and it, it burns your house down. Well, you, know, you can say, well, I, well, how foolish of me. I should have checked, that was my fault. Yes, you can explain it. It's when you can't explain it, when you can't explain the suffering. And that was part of Job's dilemma. He couldn't explain what was happening to him. Add to this that his friends each in turn assumed that he was guilty of sin and had brought these calamities onto himself. And so Job experienced the loss of his final possession and that was the respect and the sympathy of his friends during a time of extreme suffering. At least, you know, that guy in the hospital with his leg up in traction and the bandages and the, the scrapes and cuts, at least his family is going to come and his friends will come by and say, oh, you poor guy, oh, I'm really sorry that happened to you. Is there anything I can do to help? And don't worry, it'll all be okay. You know, you get that kind of loving when something like that happens, but not Job. His friends come along and <laughs> their only goal is to, to, to tell him that he is wrong, that he must have done some, you must have done something wrong. You, you, talk, you talk like that to a little child sometimes, right? <laughs> something bad happens and you say, well, you must have done something wrong. Well, that was, that was their attitude with him. You must have done something really terrible to, to, you know, to have all of these bad things happen to you. And so with this summary in mind, uh, we will examine the various uh, characters in Job's story and perhaps um, uh, an outline of the book that we will use in this study, but also a couple of other type of outlines so that you'll know that there's more than one way to chop up uh, this particular material. All right, so uh, it's good to have an outline because with an outline, uh, you can see both the big picture and the small picture at the same time. You always have your eye on your outline because you know where you're going uh, uh, as you study the, uh, the book. So let's talk about the characters here. The book of Job uh, could easily be staged as a play. When I read Job, I, in my mind's eye, I, I imagine this could be a play. I mean, you know, there's no uh, army scenes or battle scenes where you have armies. There's, there's not a lot of movement. You know, it's mostly dialogue between two individuals or more. So I, I can almost see it as a play. I'm even surprised they haven't made a play out of it. Maybe they have and I haven't uh, noticed, but anyways. Um, most of the action revolves around the dialogues between two main character, either, uh, characters, either Job and God, and the dialogues that they have, you know, God with the devil, and then at the end, God and Job, and then Job with his wife, and then Job uh, with his three friends, and then a fourth friend that comes and you know, chimes in his opinion near the end of the book. And of course, uh, the book also includes Job's responses to his wife, to his friends, to God. So we begin with the main character, and the main character, of course, is uh, Job himself. He uh, was a wealthy patriarch with a large family who lived in the land of Uz, modern day Saudi Arabia. Uh, many think during the time of the uh, patriarchs, 
Uh, we know, remember last week I said there's always this argument, was he a real person or not? How do we know? Well, I believe he is a, a figure of history, a true person, because he's mentioned along with Noah and Daniel in the book of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 14, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, if a country sins against me by committing unfaithfulness, and I stretch out my hand against it, destroy its supply of bread, send famine against it, and cut off from uh, both man and beast, even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in its midst by their own righteousness, they could, they could only deliver themselves, declares the Lord. And so he's mentioned as a person by one of the prophets. I think that's a very strong argument uh, for the fact that uh, he was not simply a story or a figure in history, but was an actual, an actual person. Um, he was not an Israelite. No references in any way to key theological elements in the book, you know, the law or covenant or promise or the temple or Yahweh. Uh, we know from the book he was uh, blameless and upright. He was a man who feared God. He was a believer and a man who shunned uh, evil. Uh, he had grown children, seven sons and three daughters, nice big family. And his sons themselves were wealthy men who hosted lavish feasts, especially on their birthdays. And we'll learn more about Job's life and his character and his experience uh, when we begin studying the text and then we, we'll start that next week. Uh, another character is Job's wife. She's, she doesn't appear a lot, but she's an important character. Not much is said about her in the Bible as such. Some Jewish folklore gives her name as Sittis, S-I-T-I-S, which is a root word for Satan. <laughs> I don't know if he knew that before he married her, but <laughs> he found out later. Um, these same sources claim that she died and eventually Job married Dinah, uh, who was Jacob's daughter. But uh, none of this is uh, supported by the scripture itself. Again, folklore, Jewish writings of the time or you know, afterwards talk about this. All the Bible records, however, is that at a certain point, she encourages her husband Job to kill himself in order to put an end to his suffering. And then she's no longer mentioned in the book. Another important uh, individual mentioned is Satan, an angel referred to as a son of God here in this book. The term Satan only appears in three books in the Old Testament. Only three places uh, he appears, three of the books. And uh, the word means adversary. I think that's a good, that's a good uh, name for him, right? The adversary. Isn't he the adversary in our lives? Isn't he the one that keeps pushing back against all the good we try to do or the good we try to be? There's always that power pushing back on us. So that's his name, the adversary. Uh, he is able to exist and move in both the physical and the spiritual realm. Uh, he's also responsible for Job's suffering, as we will learn when we review his exchange with God regarding Job and Job's righteousness and Job's faith. Now the key to the story is that we know this. We have information as the reader, as do God and the devil, but this is never revealed to Job. So we know why Job is suffering. We know it right from the beginning. And of course, God knows and Satan knows. But Job never finds out. Even when God appears to him at the end of the book, I think I mentioned this last week, you know, it'd be like a good time. If I was writing the book, I'd say, now Job, just for your own information, to comfort you a little bit, to know that you, know, you didn't suffer for nothing, you know, this is what really happened. Uh, 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 there's no epilogue. <laughs> Nowhere in the book does Job ever find out why these things happened to him, just that they did. And we'll talk about that at length as we go through the book. And then of course, there are Job's friends. Now it was a custom as it is 
still today, to visit and sit with and encourage and mourn with those who were ill or suffering uh, hardships. Less today, you know, people, they have a viewing for you know, between seven and eight on Friday, there'll be a viewing, Saturday there'll be a funeral and that's it. You know? I remember as a kid, however, not just for my, my own dad when he died, but for other relatives, I mean, the, 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 the viewing would go on for a couple of days. Uh, my, my, my dad's funeral, the, the, the funeral parlor was open at 10 a.m. and it shut down at 10 o'clock at night. And all day long, you know, we were there, you know, and go to the restaurant to, at lunch to eat and go back to the funeral parlor and sit there. And, you know, people would come and go all day long, you know, two, three days, three days of, uh, of that. And so we did have a more respect for the time of mourning than we do now. We're too busy to do that. And of course, uh, we were under the false impression that when the funeral's over, so is the grieving. And that's usually the biggest mistake that people make. They think once the preacher says, uh, you know, finish his prayer, you know, we commend his soul to God and God bless you and go in peace and that's over. People put on their coats and they get their car keys and they're heading out and visiting. They think that the, the, you know, the mourning and the, and the uh, grieving is finished, but it's not. It's just beginning at that point. And so this was the custom at that time as well. And due to the serious nature of Job's woes and condition, three of his friends come to sit uh, and comfort him, or so we think at first. They come from uh, the northwest of uh, Arabia, and upon arriving, they simply remain silent out of respect for his great loss and suffering. They don't say a word. When they do begin to speak, however, we begin to see what kind of person each one of these men are. Now, one good note about them is that they came to say what they had to say to Job in person, and they didn't talk about him behind his back. You know, most of the time, this type of gossip uh, tries to determine why the person is being punished. It's just the subject of gossip. Hey, did you hear about so-and-so? Yes, you know, he, he left her, you know, he meaning the husband, left her uh, alone with uh, two little boys or something, or three girls or something like that. And, they're and people talk among themselves. I wonder what happened, I wonder what he did, I wonder what she did, you know? And, 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 and it's the subject of gossip, the misery of someone else, the, the heartache of someone else becomes simply you know, a subject of discussion and, and gossip for other people. But in this case, these men travel a long distance to you know, face Job and tell him to his face what they think. So I think that's one good thing about, uh, about these guys. And so the four uh, people involved these men, three friends and an, an additional one. The first one is uh, Eliphaz. Let me get the slide up, there we go. Eliphaz, his name means God is fine gold. God is fine gold. He was a descendant of Esau. Uh, we find out that he is old and devout, uh, much more gracious than the other uh, men. And some have referred to him as a mystic of that era, okay? Today, you know, how would you classify him? Today, people would say, well, he's a liberal. He's a kind of liberal-minded, okay? Uh, another character, uh, Bildad, uh, uncertain source, I tried to find a source for his name, couldn't find anything. However, he was a descendant of Abraham and Keturah, his, Abraham's wife after the death of Sarah. Uh, he's been called a scholar or a traditionalist according to his speech. We, we, we see when we listen to him that he is less kind and sympathetic than Eliphaz in his comments to Job. And in the dialogue, Bildad, he stands for a rigid authoritarianism, okay? Uh, today we would say, well, he's, he's a conservative. He would be the conservative one of uh, the three. And then there's Zophar, Zophar. Uh, I always like to say so far, so good in this lesson. <laughs> Zophar, his name uh, means a male goat. <laughs> How'd you like that name? A male goat. 
uh, and his style reflects his name. Uh, he is dogmatic, he is impetuous, he is intolerant, uh, he was wise in his own eyes, he was unmoving, he was judgmental. Uh, today we'd say, well, he's legalistic. That's pretty much how we describe him. I'm wrong, you, I'm right, you're wrong. You know. And if you don't agree with me, well then you, you, can't, you can't be part of me you know, because I, I know everything. And the, this uh, Zophar was very much like that. And then we have Elihu. Elihu isn't part of the three. He was a kind of a bystander minding his business and waiting to speak until the other ones uh, spoke. He was the youngest of the four. And as I said, he waited uh, until everyone spoke before he speaks. Uh, in his speeches, he doesn't actually add anything new to the arguments. However, he does rebuke the three uh, and repeats their arguments and finishes by correcting two of Job's erroneous points. One, that God is unjust somehow. Job you know, was floating this idea in his arguments that somehow God, the answer is God's made a mistake, he's unjust. No way this could be happening to me. And so it is left to Elihu to kind of you know, correct him in that. And that God refuses to speak to Job. Job's again, one of his arguments, one of his complaints was that you know, God won't talk to me. You know, I wish we could have a court here, a trial, you know, and I'd get up there and I'd defend myself, you know, and we'd see what God would say, but he just won't show up. He just won't talk to me. And of course, Elihu uh, corrects Job uh, in, in his thinking as far as God refusing to speak to him. Of course, we're going to examine these speeches more clearly as we review the text. The other character here, of course, is God himself. He appears at the beginning with Satan, and then he appears at the end with Job. He does not appear to Job in order to comfort or to explain, but rather to reveal himself more clearly to Job. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't, he doesn't appear, you know, to, as I said before, to explain to Job, now don't get excited, this is what happened, and you know, I had my reason, no, no. He simply appears to Job to give Job a glimpse of who God is. The idea being that being in God's presence is a transcendent experience that goes beyond explaining, beyond understanding, beyond comforting, beyond pain, being in the presence of God eclipses every other feeling, every other thought. Uh, this is a little away from what we're talking about, but Lise and I often discuss you know, the idea of heaven and you know, have you never had that discussion? Will we know each other in heaven? And you know, uh, what, what kind of relationship will we have in heaven? Will we remember stuff? You know, will we regret things? that we've done? Will we be sorry that we don't see a certain person there? And the idea that we get from Job and other places, but especially in Job, is that being in the presence of God is an all-consuming experience. There's no room for remembering what happened on earth. There's no, you know, there's no other consideration. Just being in the presence of God takes up all of what you have, okay? And we see that uh, when, we get to, uh, uh, when we get to that part. In the end, of course, Job gets to have a clearer, crisper vision of the true and living God. And this in itself is enough. It's more than enough. No need anymore for answers, no smoothing over of feelings, I have been in the presence of God and now I exist on another plane. I, I'm on another plane, okay? I'm no longer the same person as I was before. All right, so there's always a lot of uh, possible um, outlines that can be used in the study of any of the books of the Bible. The difference between the variations are usually based on the specific focus or the approach that the teacher wants to use 
in studying the material. For example, in a basic study model where you are introducing the book to those not familiar with it, and, and, and I'm taking you know, somewhat this approach with you, thinking that most people here know about the book of Job. Some of you may have even taught the book of Job, but I'm assuming everybody knows in general the story of Job. That's why I'm kind of reviewing all of that before we begin the actual textual uh, study. Uh, but a lot of times if you're teaching people who are just beginning, you, uh, you use a, uh, you know, an overview uh, kind, of, uh, kind of an outline. And I've got a copy of one here, just want to show you. This one is uh, by Warren Worsby. He's an American writer and speaker and theologian, written a lot of books. Uh, and this is the outline that he has, the way that he has to outline the book. So he begins uh, with Job's distress, you know, his prosperity, his adversity, his perplexity. His perplexity is he's trying to wonder, how, why has this happened to me? First part of the book. Second section is Job's defense, chapter four all the way to chapter 37. And these are in rounds, okay? So the first round, chapter four to 14, Eliphaz speaks, Bildad speaks, Zophar speaks, and Job answers, Eliphab, Job answers, Bildad, Job answers so far. So he goes back and forth. One of them speaks, Job responds. The other speaks, Job responds. And it continues that way for three rounds, okay? Second round, same idea from uh, chapter 15 to 21. Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, they speak. Job replies to each one of them. There's a bit of a change on the third round of speeches. Eliphaz speaks, Job replies, Bildad speaks, and Job replies, but Zophar is quiet, right? Zophar uh, says uh, nothing. And then you have, uh, the next part is young Elihu, he's the fourth individual. He speaks, and for quite a long time, from chapters 32 to all the way to chapter 37. And a couple of things that he says, he contradicts Job's friends, uh, he contradicts Job himself, and then at the end, he proclaims God's justice, God's goodness, and God's mercy. In a sense, Elihu is trying to defend God, as if God needs defense, but he tries to defend God uh, from the things uh, that Job has said. And then uh, the next uh, section, is Job's deliverance from chapter 38 to 42, and that's broken down, broken down into two sections. First section, God appears to Job, or God humbles Job, 38 to 42. And he does this by asking him questions, questions that are too great for Job to answer, the questions that Job has no answers to. And then secondly, uh, Job acknowledges his inability to understand. You know, he repents at this point. And then the final section, God honors Job, chapter 42, where, Job, uh, where God rebukes the friends, the critics, and he restores the wealth of uh, Job. Uh, in this outline, we can see in one glance a pretty detailed description of the events of this book in chronological order and thus quickly become familiar with the story and the sequence of Job's story. Now, if you wanted a compressed version of this outline, you could say that the three main divisions of this book are as follows. Here's another outline, a compressed outline. Bang, three, three pieces. One, Job's distress, chapters one to three. Two, Job's defense, chapters four to 37. Three, Job's deliverance, chapter 38 to 42. I like these compressed outlines because it helps you to remember how the book is, uh, how the book is uh, divided. Now, um, uh, in this outline, we can see in one glance a pretty detailed description of the events of this book, again, in chronological uh, order and uh, much more compressed. So having these type of outlines helps teachers and students not get lost in the poetry and the details when studying the book 
they help provide context as you examine it more closely. Uh, and you might be wondering, man, he sure has taken a lot of time to get to the, to the text. You know, a whole lesson just for the critical introduction, when was it written, who was it written by, and so on and so forth. And now a complete other lesson, talking about just the characters, uh, talking about the various types of outlines. And I'm doing this because when you get to the text, the poetry is so thick, so repetitious in certain terms, uh, that you get lost in the story because it kind of all sounds the same from chapter to chapter. Are they saying the same thing? And so when you have your eye on the outline, you can kind of stay with the author, you can stay with the story, you can stay with the lesson, all right? Now, uh, I'm not going to use the first type of outline, uh, the detailed outline, and I'm not going to use the uh, compressed outline. I'm going to use for our study what's called a thematic outline, all right? A thematic outline based on the title of the series, which is Faithful Living in Times of Crisis. So here's the thematic outline, okay? So there's the book of Job, Faithful Living in Times of Crisis. So the physical crisis. So we're going to start talking about the physical crisis, the devil's attack, chapters one, two, and three. Then we're going to study another crisis that Job has, and that's a theological crisis that he suffers. And this is when Job's friends begin to attack him. And then the third section is the spiritual crisis that Job uh, has. Uh, where God appears to him and challenges, uh, challenges him, and where we see that in the end, Job, uh, Job's faith saves him. Uh, so this is our outline. We're going to be studying this book using this outline here, and I think this will help you uh, to stay with the story. And I think also it'll, it'll give meaning to what is happening from chapter to chapter, okay? So this outline assumes that the uh, student is familiar with the story and character so that the focus of teaching can be on the attempt to answer the question, how does one maintain faith in a situation or a period of time where there doesn't seem to be any satisfying answers or any type of cosmic fairness? How do you do that? I can deal with something. I drive too fast, I have a crash, I break my leg. I can piece that together, makes sense to me. But uh, that a child dies of leukemia, that's hard to make sense of. That a good woman uh, who uh, serves uh, the Lord, who serves her family, who serves her husband, who, 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 is, who, who brings joy uh, to wherever she is, falls ill and, 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 and is non-functional for many, many years, uh, bedridden, and then dies a, a difficult death. How do you make sense of something like that? How do you make sense of something like that? I mean, uh, you can't help but say, it's just not fair. How come there's some women who have three or four kids, you know, not married, not trying to have a family, but whoops, you know, three or four kids, you know, and whatever, some go off to adoption and others go there. You know. And then there are these other women who would give anything to have a child and to raise that child in a Christian home and to give that child the best life that that child could have, but she can't have any babies. I mean, where's the fairness of that? How does that work? How do you manage to maintain your faith? How do you manage to maintain the joy of your faith when you have to suffer that type of crisis in your life? And I think the book of Job will help us to grapple with these type of crises when they happen in our lives. All right, so in our next uh, session, we're going to be looking at the text, hooray, of the book. And we're going to be using uh, this particular outline and approach to familiarize ourselves with this uh, book and answer uh, that many other questions uh, come up 
because of the uh, book of Job. So I'm going to give you an assignment again, a reminder uh, to read uh, Job chapter one to three. Uh, and uh, this time we'll actually begin with the text uh, next week and uh, make our way uh, through to the end. All right, so that's uh, the second introductory lesson uh, to, this, uh, to this book. That's it for tonight. Thank you very much for your attention.